Hello everybody, it's Doug here. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to replicate the vintage switches that have seen 60 years service inside Brian May's Red Special guitar. Their function is to switch the three Burns Trisonic pickups on and off, and in and out of phase with each other. And this helps Brian to extract so many distinctive tones. During the video, I'll show you under the hood of my Red Special guitar, and discuss some of the techniques available to modern hobbyists and amateur luthiers that I've deployed in this project, including CNC and 3D printing. My YouTube videos cover a wide range of topics related to Brian May's musical equipment, and further information on all my projects is available on my website, dsgb.net. Please support my work by liking, commenting and subscribing here on YouTube, and follow me on social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest. I'll start by explaining why these switches are so sought after by amateur and professional luthiers who want to build an authentic replica of the Brian May Red Special. Manuel Angelini, a vintage electronics enthusiast from Nantes in France, who has been building exquisite replicas of Brian May's Deakley amplifier since 2008, has very generously lent me this vintage Jean Reno switch of the same style fitted to Brian May's Red Special guitar. Check out Manuel's website, doxyworld.com, where you can buy his Supersonic Pro Deke Amp replica and some other products. The Jean Reno company was founded in 1928 by the Swiss Henri Jean Reno, who took over a small metallurgy company located in the town of Dole in France and began turning and manufacturing lamp bases. In 1957, CK Components was formed by the combination of US based CK Components, France based Jean Reno, and Germany-based Rudolf Schadow Company. CNK Components was acquired by ITT Industries in 2000, which was itself acquired by Little Fuse Inc., headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, in 2022. To illustrate why this vintage switch is key to building an authentic Brian May Red Special replica, let's compare my homemade Red Special, which is fitted with vintage Jean Reno switches, mounted on a replica aluminium frame, and a Burns Signature Red Special that I modified myself, and is fitted with modern switchcraft equivalents, mounted to the underside of the acrylic pickguard. As we take a look at the components in the control chamber of my Red Special replica, First of all, pay attention to how close the bridge pickup phase reversal switch is to the right side wall. Notice also how closely spaced the metal chassis of the on-off switch and the phase reversal switch are for each individual pickup. The narrower metal chassis and smaller planform plastic actuated tip on the vintage Jean Reno switch allows you to recreate the same aesthetic appearance of the original guitar. Notice the difference in size in this close-up comparison of the Jean Reno switches in my Red Special replica with the Switchcraft equivalents on my modern Burns signature Red Special. These improved aesthetic nuances were deployed to impressive effect by Andrew Guyton of Guyton Guitars in his limited edition run of highly authentic Time Warp Red Special replicas. These were produced in response to demand generated by the prop guitar he made for the hugely successful movie Bohemian Rhapsody. I provided the Tufnell phenolic resin wafers for the switches in these instruments, and I resurrected this work to make myself a set of six pieces for future use, and of course, to make this video. Moving forward into the disassembly of this vintage John Reno switch, I've placed some other small items in the frame here to give you a sense of the scale involved. I'm bending the mounting lugs on the 0.8mm thick steel chassis away from the wafer in two stages. Firstly, using a pair of pliers until there is sufficient clearance to insert the blade of a slot head screwdriver underneath them. Then I can prise them carefully towards the vertical, which will allow the base and the internals to be taken apart. This reveals the internal mechanism, which consists of two tinned copper sliding contacts which fit into rebates in the plastic actuator, a moustache shaped steel wire detent, and six riveted static tinned copper contacts. Let's examine all the component parts to determine how best to replicate them. The steel chassis was most likely die stamped and folded in one operation. The options open to me are either laser cutting and manual folding, or CNC milling from equivalent thickness aluminium sheet. The Tufnol phenolic resin insulated base or wafer was also likely die punched due to the definition of the corners of the rectangular holes. 
I know from making the wafers for the Time Warp Red Specials that this material will CNC mill very easily, and small diameter cutters can be used. The plastic actuator, perhaps made of PVC or nylon, would have been injection moulded in a larger ray. In the next section, I'll discuss two modern DIY 3D printing methods for making these without industrial machinery. I will try CNC milling the sliding contacts from 0.35mm thick brass sheet using the same feed rates that have worked successfully for sheet aluminium. If this yields unsatisfactory results, then I'll resort to some manual cutting methods. To enable me to set up CNC cuts, 3D print runs, and design any jigs and templates required, I first need to draw representations of the five separate component parts in 3D CAD. So let's take a look at how these fit together. It's worth noting at this stage that there are two distinct variants of this switch. I'm replicating the earlier variant, which matches those in Brian's original red special. The later variant, which you saw fitted to my red special, has cutouts in the wafer and a slightly different plastic actuator design, but the principal dimensions are either identical or very similar. Before moving into the make section of this video, I'll take the opportunity to talk about the choices I made for 3D printing the plastic actuators and the advice I was offered that influenced this choice. 3D printing technology has matured since I first got involved in the joint project to replicate these switches in late 2019. I was interested in experimenting with 3D printing, but didn't have a strong use case, and no clear market leader had emerged in FDM, that's fusion deposition modeling, for hobby and low volume production applications. However, Prusa Research, started by Joseph Prusa in Czechia, now seems to be a go to brand for small FDM 3D printers, and I considered buying a used example of the Prusa i3 Mark III S Plus that I'm showing you here. My budget for the 3D printer was 200 to 250 pounds. Several were available on a popular online auction site in late 2023, but most were collection only and located a considerable distance away. You know how it is. However, the seller of one machine located within a reasonable travel distance advised me to use 3D resin printing, SLA or stereolithography, in preference to FDM for such a small item with intricate detail. I then spent a considerable amount of time researching the different machines available from different manufacturers, the types and colours of resin available, the software required to prepare the files, and what post-processing was necessary. I eventually resolved that the Elegoo Mars 4 DLP machine that I'm showing you on the screen now was suitable for my intended application and any possible future hobby work. Although a relatively new model released in 2023, it was on offer in January 2024 direct from Elegoo at a price that was within my budget. I went ahead and bought this machine and some white ABS-like 3D printing resin, which generally costs about £35 per litre. The only other necessary item required was a UV lamp to cure the resin after printing and cleaning with isopropyl alcohol. Thankfully these are plentiful on the aftermarket because they are used in the cosmetics and beauty trade in nail bars and for domestic use curing nail gel. Moving now into making all the component parts, I'll start with the CNC milling operations. First up, I milled the phenolic resin wafers in batch arrays of 12 because I had previously set up these files for the Guyton Time Warp Red Special Switches in 2019. For this cut, I use a 0.8mm diameter cutter with low feed rates. This clip is speeded up eight times. The switch wafers are 1 16th of an inch or 1.6 millimeters thick, but it was not possible to source Tufnell sheet in imperial dimensions. The nearest available thickness is 2 millimeters, so some adjustment is required. This can be done by abrading manually, but it is possible to mill Tufnell sheet successfully as you can see. I left some room for minor final adjustment with a fine abrasive paper. In this shot you can see the end result of cutting a batch of 12 Tufnell wafers. Next up I milled the metal chassis from 0.8mm thick aluminium sheet which I was able to find in a suitable grade, 5052 in this case. As I've shown in a previous video on making the Red Special Roller Bridge, it is possible to use a hobby class CNC machine to mill aluminium. A narrow diameter cutter is required and I used a 1mm two flute cutter in this case. Low feed rates and a lubricant such as dry PTFE are also necessary. I'm illustrating this process with some speeded up and heavily edited footage. I used the same feed rates and conditions 
one millimeter cutter, dry PTFE lubricant, and a very shallow depth of cut per pass, 0.05 millimeters, to mill the brass sliders from 0.35 millimeter thick brass sheet. This is a general grade suitable for hobbycraft work, and as you can see, yields a highly satisfactory result. Next up, I'll take you through how I deployed 3D resin printing SLA technology to create the all-important plastic switch actuator. I don't intend to discuss the sequences and processes involved in detail, because there are numerous excellent instructional YouTube videos covering all aspects of 3D resin SLA printing. Whichever 3D printing method you choose, slicing software is required to generate the code which the machine will execute to produce the objects. I chose the free version of Lychee Slicer, and I'm illustrating preparing a single switch for printing with the Elegoo Mars 4 DLP machine and frozen brand ABS-like creamy white resin. The software automatically adds supports, and as a novice to this technology, I'm accepting the output as fit for purpose. For the same reason, I used the resin manufacturer's recommended settings for this machine. One advantage of SLA 3D resin printing is that multiple objects can be printed in the same time as single objects, so it's advantageous to fill the build plate area with a practical maximum quantity of objects. I'm illustrating six objects in this sequence, but ultimately I printed batches of 12. This batch of 12 actuators, just emerging from the resin vat, took about three hours to print. Examining the printed objects after an initial wash with isopropyl alcohol and before UV curing, you can see that the print definition is highly satisfactory with the manufacturer's recommended parameters, especially on the fine detail of the ridges on top of the actuator. There are no obvious issues at this stage, so I'll move on and remove these from the build plate, then show you some of the post-processing required. Normal practice is to scrape each object, which is still attached by the supports to a thin base, off the build plate using a thin metal scraper. I'll dump these straight into a bath of isopropyl alcohol, contained in a plastic tray, ready for the next stage. It is usually necessary to snip the supports off the printed object with a pair of flush pliers, but in this case the base and supports can snap off by hand, leaving only small bumps which can then be removed using abrasive paper after curing. After cleaning with a soft bristle toothbrush, we can move forward to the curing stage. I'll cure each batch of 12 actuators using this UV lamp designed for curing nail gel, which I bought for a very reasonable price. It is recommended to cure 3D printed objects for one to two minutes, so I'll give these one minute, then turn them over and expose them for another minute on the other side. I don't quite understand why the resin doesn't fully cure during the exposure of each layer in the 3D printer, or how with darker pigmented resins, for example grey is very common, how externally applied UV light penetrates much beyond the surface to cure the resin in the bulk material. However, this is the accepted method of post-processing, so I'll just go with the flow here. The footage I'm showing you here is after a test print with an earlier design of actuator. Conditions weren't optimal, and this seems to have resulted in some vertical ridges on the tip. Moving on to the other components, it would be very challenging to make the tinned brass contacts, because these are formed by precision die stamping from very thin tinned copper sheet and are folded over. Other than finding a local manufacturer or supplier who would likely require a large minimum order, the next best option is to salvage contacts from vintage multipole rotary switches. The examples I'm showing you here are Jean Renault brand and have identical looking contacts in size and shape to the original parallel slide switches that we're trying to replicate. I was able to salvage sufficient contacts to make up seven individual parallel switches with a small number of spares. I achieved this by cutting and grinding the blue plastic wafer using a rotary multi-tool, taking care not to damage the contacts. The detent wire performs several functions, some of which don't become evident until you disassemble, inspect, then reassemble an original switch. Firstly, its spring tension holds the actuator up to ensure that the brass sliders are always touching the contacts, but it allows the actuator some freedom of movement in the vertical plane. Secondly, it secures the switch in whichever horizontal position it is selected to. 
and thirdly, it gives a positive action and feedback to the user when the switch is moved. For these reasons, it is important to select the correct gauge of wire and to replicate the wire form accurately. To achieve this, I photographed the wire from the donor switch and imported this into TurboCAD, which allowed me to reproduce the form in a 3D shape. Next, I determined the bend radii and pin diameters required to form the bends and designed this pin board, which I CNC cut and manually drilled from Delrin and engineering plastic. I formed each detent wire by securing the wire in a loop around a stainless steel panel pin and then via some guide pins fashioned from stainless steel wire of 1.8mm diameter before forming the bends around 1.3 and 1.8mm diameter stainless steel wire. I inserted each pin successively to allow space to manipulate the wire. The larger radii were formed around a section of 7mm diameter stainless steel rod. Removing the wire is a straightforward matter of just pulling out the pins and trimming off any excess. I bought piano wire in pre-cut lengths to make these detents. The original wire, the darker coloured one in the next frame, measures 0.32mm diameter via digital calipers. I also evaluated a thicker gauge, 0.4mm in diameter, but once I assembled a test switch, it was clear that the thinner gauge is fit for purpose. With all the individual component parts now made, we can move forward into the assembly phase. The first job I did was to fold the aluminium chassis. To make this operation easier, I scored fold lines in the surface of the aluminium sheet using a solid carbide engraving cutter. I designed a three-part folding jig in TurboCAD and milled this from white Delrin plastic using my CNC machine. I spent a lot of money buying Stumac tools when I was building my Red Special replica to take advantage of a favourable US dollar to pound sterling exchange rate and get value for money from the shipping cost. This lovely fret arbor press has sat unused for several years since, but it is ideal for bending these sheet metal parts. I'll talk you through the sequence of using this apparatus. I've stuck the base of the jig to the arbor press bed using automotive grade high strength double sided adhesive foam tape. The upper part secures the chassis in place during the folding operation using two countersunk metric 2.5mm machine screws, which locate into the brass threaded inserts thermoset into the protruding part of the base. The three sections of the jig are assembled, with the upper section located in the arbor press shaft using a long hex bolt, M5 stainless steel threaded rod, and a stainless steel coupling nut. Then you compress the chassis sides and mounting tabs over and withdraw the upper section. Next, unscrew the holding down strip and remove the folded chassis. I found that the best way to do this is to manually apply the U-shaped upper section again, which achieves the full 90 degree fold and secures the folded chassis inside the channel. This can be removed safely without burring the edge of the aluminium by easing it out along the channel using some soft wood. Next up, I riveted the static contacts salvaged from the Jean Reno multipole rotary switch onto the Tufnel wafers using a mini die and punch kit mounted in my mini drill press. The PCB rivets are Keystone brand tinned copper number 24 wide roll eyelets with a 1.6mm outer diameter. The die has a spring loaded pin onto which the rivet is mounted upside down. Then you install the wafer and align the contact with the rebate and compress the rivet using the punch. With care, it's possible to achieve both a secure fix and a cosmetically acceptable finish to the punched eyelet roll. At this stage, we have a quantity of plastic actuators, several folded chassis, and tufnel bases with static contacts riveted in place. The final stages of preparing the component parts for assembly are to fold the mounting tabs of the brass sliding contacts and insert them into the underside of the plastic actuators. The 0.35mm thick brass sheet can easily be folded by hand by mounting the components in a precision engineering bench vise and rolling a section of steel rod over them as I'm showing here. To ensure that the sliders are securely mounted in the actuator, I'm heating them up with a heat gun and thermosetting them into the plastic. I designed the rectangular rebates in the actuator base to be slightly undersized to account for this final thermosetting operation. Let's review the installation in all six switches before moving on.
OK, that looks good, so let's assemble a switch. Here are the four sub-assemblies, so firstly I'll insert the detent wire. Next I'll slide the actuator into the static contacts. That looks good, so let's go ahead and place the metal chassis on top, ready for folding the mounting tabs over. Rather than securing the assembly in a vise and risk damaging it through overcompression or slippage, I've simply CNC milled a switch shaped rebate in some softwood. This prevents unwanted movement while I bend the mounting tabs over, as you can see in this sequence. Well that's all from me, so thanks very much for watching till the end. Please like, comment and subscribe on my YouTube videos, and check out my website, dsgb.net. Thank <laughs> you.